If you were hired by a big, well-established company over the last two or three decades, you probably thought you had a clear pact with your employer. In exchange for many years of labor, you would, upon retirement, be able to collect a reasonable pension. Today, however, there's a crisis looming in America's pension plans, as many workers discover that the retirement benefits they were promised may not, in fact, all be there for them. None of us is entirely immune from the problem. I'm Sarah Bartlett, and this is our topic today on USA Inc. Joining us today is Stephen Kandarian, the former executive director of the Pension Benefits Guarantee Corporation, the federal government's insurance fund, if you will, for corporate pension plans. Steve, thanks for being with us today. Thanks for having me. How vulnerable are workers' pensions in this country? It really depends, Sarah. Um, actually, before I answer that question, let me just mention that I am no longer at the agency. I'm speaking now on my own behalf, not the agencies or uh, the Bush administration. Fair. Fair point. Great. Uh, it, it depends. If you're a worker, you should look at two things. First, how financially sound is my company? If you work for a very strong company, you probably have nothing to worry about. Uh, the second thing you should look at is how funded or underfunded is your pension plan. If the plan is very underfunded and the company is in difficult financial straits, then you probably have some things to worry about. And how can you find out if your plan is underfunded? Where would you look for that information? Well, there is information available at the Department of Labor and even requirements by, by corporations to give out this information to the workers. But sometimes the, informa sometimes the information is not very current. And it can be a little bit misleading in terms of people thinking their pension plans are well-funded when, in fact, they are not. But on a national basis, is this a big problem, a little problem? How serious an issue is this from your standpoint? I mean, you just oversaw this in, in Washington. I think it's a pretty big problem. A number of firms have highly underfunded pension plans right now. In addition to that, these are companies that are competing against other businesses that may not have pension plans like this and don't have these kinds of funding requirements. So sometimes they're put at a competitive disadvantage against other businesses that don't have this burden. I mean, is it a $5 billion problem, a $20 billion problem? Can you give me some rough yeah. numbers? Well, um, the PBGC itself is underfunded by about 10 or $11 billion. This year? Well, end of last year was $11 billion, yes. And those numbers could get worse if things turn out badly in the airline industry or some other industry that's going through some structural changes with highly underfunded pension plans. How did this problem come about? Why, why do we have an $11 billion deficit? at the end of last year? Well, at the agency, there's a number of reasons, but primarily they don't control their own fate. That is, they can't charge premiums. That's set by Congress. They don't set the funding rules. The agency doesn't set the funding rules. It's set, again, by Congress. So essentially, uh, the current system doesn't um, enable the funding status to be high enough in these pension plans. There really should be stronger funding rules and probably risk-based premiums that would get better behavior into the system and more cash into the agency to fill its deficit. But in the meantime, I pick up the paper, and every day it seems like there's another airline that's threatening in its bankruptcy filings to stop paying into this fund, stop paying the pensions to its workers. I mean, United is certainly a key case right now. Uh, that $11 billion, if all of these airlines do that, could become much greater, could it not? Yes, it could. It, it could get appreciably larger if a couple of the large airlines with highly underfunded pension plans terminated their pension plans using what's called a distressed termination, where they can go to court and prove to the uh, judge's satisfaction that unless they terminate one or more of their pension plans, they'll be unable to reemerge from Chapter 11, effectively will have to go into liquidation and sell off the, the assets of the company. And that's what's happening at United. Well, unclear whether they're going to actually try to terminate the pension plans, but some people feel they might go down that path. And if they do, what do you think another airline like U.S. Airways might try to do to remain, quote, competitive? Right. Well, the, the airlines have to actually go and prove in court that they can't get out of bankruptcy unless they shed one or more of their plans. They can't simply say that my competitor did so, therefore I automatically should be able to. 
they have to go and show to the court that their business plan indicates that they cannot get out of bankruptcy, they can't get financing from private sources to reemerge and compete again. If they can prove that, then they can terminate their pension plans under current law. So if I'm a United employee, I stand the possibility that my pensions that I thought were there are not going to be there in their entirety. Is that right? That's right. The pensions are put into a trust, and the corporation can't really grab that trust, but if it's not high enough funded, high enough level of funding, then when that plan gets terminated into the PBGC, the insurance company, the agency is in the position of making up part or all of that difference. And as to how much of that difference it makes up depends upon what kind of benefits were promised by the company. Congress, in its legislation, has uh, guaranteed certain benefits, but not other benefits. The basic insurance benefits, basic pension benefits at age 65 is really what Congress focused on not things like early retirement subsidies or supplements and, and things that give people uh, money as much earlier in life. So what kind of shortfall might a United employee face if this, if this scenario plays out? It depends. If you're a flight attendant, probably very little shortfall. The agency would pick up uh, most, most everything that was promised to you. Everything that's been accrued to the time when the curtain came down, the plane was terminated. Now, you won't earn benefits in the future that you are expecting to get, so you'll lose out on that. But as to what you received at that point in time when the plan was terminated, you'll get most everything if you are um, a middle-income worker. But Congress really set this up as a middle-class program, and some of the pilots' plans in particular uh, have made very large promises for uh, people who have been with the airlines for a long time flying these planes. And sometimes uh, those payments can be $100,000 or more in retirement. And Congress set a cap at about $44,000 a year. Now, the laws are very complicated. There are ways to actually get a pilot more than $44,000 a year if there's some uh, sufficient funds in the plan through the PBGC. But they'll still get some cutbacks for sure. So that could be an enormous change in someone's the, the end of their career that they thought they had $100,000 in income and now it's only forty-five, fifty thousand. $50,000. That's an enormous change. How many people might someday face this prospect? if this scenario just keeps going? Well, most of the system we're talking about um, relates to middle-class workers and, and middle-income workers. People who depend on it the most. Right. And in, in that case, most of the people will get their full promised benefits, again, other than those early retirement kinds of benefits I was talking about, where companies may say, you're 55 years old, we're downsizing, we're going to give you an extra little help here to, to usher you on while we downsize the company. But other than that, people retiring at normal retirement age, the vast majority of those people will get what was promised to them up to the point in time when the plan terminated. But again, if you were thinking that the plan wasn't going to be terminated, that it was going to be there for the entirety of your retirement, right. um, that's an enormous change in, in thinking about your future. Right. I think <clears throat> at that point, most of these companies will probably replace those defined benefit plans with 401k plans. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> if they're the, still in existence. That's right. <laughs> And if they're not, <clears throat> what happens? If they're not, then presumably those people will re-engage at some point in the workforce if they're young enough. And the companies they go to may have a defined benefit plan or more likely will have a defined contribution plan. And now the owner shifts away from the company making that guarantee promise for a lifetime annuity to a worker to more self-reliance where the company promises to put so much money in to the 401k plan but the individual has a responsibility of investing those monies and making sure there are sufficient monies along with private savings to make it through the retirement years. So there is a, a group of people who work for companies that are sort of what I would call old school that had this traditional form of retirement benefit. That's the group that it's going to most affect. So airlines, steel companies, th places like that. Yes. But, not, but also, how about the IBMs and the General Motors of the world? Are they not yes. affected? Uh, they're in the same system. It's the more mature aspects, in some cases even declining parts of our economy that still have defined benefit plans. These plans really came into existence in, in large numbers just after World War II. Uh, when the steel industry and the auto industry unions came to the companies and said, we want these kinds of benefits for our workers. And, and one of the reasons they actually did that was, it's kind of interesting, is that um, the young men coming back from the war were trying to find these higher paying jobs, and the older men who were too old to go to war were still in the factories. They stayed there. And to move those older men out, we had to give them and some sort of retirement it. security so they could retire. And that's how it began in the 1950s and late 40s. And 
in much of industrialized America, these plans are, are still in effect. They've been negotiated with unions and, and companies. And unions value these, these uh, pension promises very highly because they are very valuable for their workers. And they're reluctant to, uh, to let them go by the wayside. So what we almost have is a situation where workers from the past who had an expectation of this and, and a promise was indeed made to them sort of being pitted against workers in new companies where there may not be unions, where they may not have made these kind of retirement benefits. They're sort of two, we're, we're sort of in a transition. Is it fair for the workers from the past to be penalized this way? Is that, is that right, that a company mm -hmm. should be able to say, sorry, I just can't make those obligations mm -hmm. anymore? I think it just comes down to economic reality. So if you're in an industry where there's competition, both foreign sometimes and domestic, that has a lower cost structure, and your company is part of that industry in a much higher cost structure um, uh, piece of it, then those companies will have to figure some business model out to survive long term. That's just the market-based economy we live in. But they're figuring it out on the backs of the workers who thought they had a promise. Well, it's, it's sort of a complicated economic argument. You can go all the way through to the consumer, too. You can say, okay, why don't we all fly higher cost airlines so we can support these workers? We may all support the fact that they have a secure retirement, but most of us won't go and pay $200 extra to fly to Washington from New York to do so. So the marketplace really speaks. Clearly. Um, if you were a worker in one of these companies, are there some things that you can do to protect yourself? Well, I think the world would probably change in a couple ways. Uh, one, the demographics have really driven a lot of what's happening here, where people um, are living much longer than they used to much uh, larger number of years in retirement to be funded by pensions or some sort of savings. So I think what's most likely to happen is you may see a creeping up of the retirement age to some degree, which is not necessarily a bad thing. It actually keeps people active both physically and mentally. Maybe phase retirement where people work less stressful jobs in their uh, later years uh, than perhaps in their younger years. Um, more reliance upon personal savings uh, more reliance upon their 401k account, they have one of those. And um, you'll see a shifting, I think, in our economy to um, a different way of providing for retirement. Less of that sort of cradle-to-grave approach and more of an approach where people take more responsibility for their own retirement. Okay. We'll be right back. The Zicklin School of Business at Baruch College of the City University of New York is the largest and most diverse accredited business school in the United States, offering high-quality, full-time and part-time degree programs at the undergraduate, master's and Ph.D. levels. For information about the Zicklin School of Business, please visit our website, zicklin.baruch.cuny.edu. That's zicklin.baruch.cuny.edu. Welcome back. I'm speaking with Stephen Kandarian, former executive director of the Pension Benefits Guarantee Corporation. Can you tell us what the role is exactly of the PBGC and how uh, it's financing and how it's going to go forward now? Sure. The PBGC is a federal government corporation that ensures defined benefit pension plans in the private sector. To date, it's been self-financing, meaning the companies that have these kinds of pensions for their workers pay premiums mandated premiums set by Congress to the agency. And the idea is those monies, plus any monies that the agency gets from a terminated pension plan, plus any investment income, plus a little bit of recoveries in bankruptcy, will pay for those pension promises that companies made to the workers when those companies go away. That's the sort of insurance fund that stands behind this vast sum of obligations. In other the words. analogy might be the, similar to the FDIC that insures bank deposits. Well, that, of course, makes me want to compare this to the savings and loan crisis, which we saw somewhat similarly, you know, in terms of, of an agency that stands behind. Right. Um, and we know there wasn't a happy outcome for taxpayers there. Mm -hmm. um, do you feel that it's adequately funded at this point? Do you, you mentioned earlier maybe raising some of the premiums. Is mm -hmm. that a policy yeah. option for us? Well, I think um, people do recognize the agency right now is in a significant deficit position, meaning it has more liabilities, pension promises that they make over a long period of time to workers whose plans have come into them, versus assets on hand today to make those payments over those years. Now, the assets are here and now, so they're not out of cash to make next year's payment. But at some point down the road, there are fewer assets than pension promises. So something has to be done. And what are the options? 
Well, there are a couple options. Um, one is that you would raise premiums, and if you do so, I would argue you should do risk-based premiums, where those who present the greatest risk to the system pay higher premiums, and those who are doing a good job um, aren't really tagged in that way. But how does that work? If someone is a, <clears throat> is a larger risk to the system, it's presumably because they have less money. So you're proposing mm -hmm. to charge them more when we know that they're the weakest right. of the bunch. How would they ever come right. up with that money? Well, that's always the d dilemma, but the premiums really aren't that big. So, uh, for example, the premiums are today $19 per plan participant. And the kinds of uh, pension promises being made year to year are typically in the thousands of dollars per worker. So you could argue, well, then, this rather, is a small than offer, price to pay. rather than offering someone $3,000, offer them $3,000 less, a little bit of a premium increase, because that premium is going to protect your pension promise if your company goes out of business. Yeah, it just seems that the ones that are having trouble can't make mm. the payments that they already have. Yeah. Um, I think that's probably more true on the funding side than the premium side. Can you the, make that, can you explain that Sure. Difference? In other words, the premiums are so low comparatively mm -hmm. that that isn't going to set a company over the bankruptcy cliff. Mm -hmm. um, the funding of their plans sometimes are so burdensome when they fall behind that those required cash payments under the Internal Revenue Code can be one of the key factors in a company deciding it has to go into Chapter 11. Um, I think the issue, though, is how do you protect the healthy companies and not, uh, if you don't have a risk-based premium, won't, won't the burden fall on the healthy part of the private sector? Right. So the flip side of the first question of how can you charge the unhealthy more is what are you going to do about the healthy? If you raise their premiums too high compared to the true economic value they're getting from this agency as mm -hmm. an insurance backup, then they might decide to exit the system. And that you can lose. they do that? Well, um, theoretically, they certainly can. In practice, it depends. Uh, if their plan is fully funded, they could, in theory at least, go to the insurance market and say, I'm done with the defined benefit world. I'm going to offer a 401k plan going forward, so I'm out of the system. And you, Mr. Insurance Company, take over all these liabilities, and I'll write you a check to take care of that. Now, I say in theory because if that company happened to be unionized and this benefit was part of a collective bargaining agreement, the union would have to agree to it. In most cases, unions won't agree to this sort of a termination. Um, the impact could get worse for taxpayers, could it not, if this burden shifts away from the private sector to the government? What if the government's left to pick up the tab right. here? Yeah, essentially, if these plans are not properly funded on an ongoing basis, um, three groups can potentially be hurt. First, workers by not getting the full pension promise they thought were coming to them, uh, especially higher paid workers. Second, uh, other companies end up potentially with higher premiums to pay for the hole that got created by those who failed and didn't fund their plans well. And third, as you note, it could fall upon the taxpayers to pick up the tab. If the hole got so large, Congress said, we simply can't raise premiums enough uh, to fill that, that deficit that PBGC has. If we did, it would drive the good companies out of the system whether referred to as adverse selection, and now all you have left are the weak companies, and now that's clearly a prescription for disaster. So, yes, the taxpayer could be left holding the bag at the end of the day. Now, that's, that raises a very interesting question, because who's the taxpayer? We're talking about a piece of the workforce that still has these defined benefit plans. On average, higher paid industrial workers, um, skilled workers. All taxpayers would pick up the burden, potentially, if there was a taxpayer bailout. Arguably, it could be a regressive tax from people who don't have pensions, maybe a 401k plan, maybe nothing, to those who do. So as you follow the money, you can see that it's a very it's complex a, and difficult issue. And it could be very unfair. That's correct. How, uh, are there some estimates for how large this potential um, hit to taxpayers could be after, say, <clears throat> 2010, 2020? Mm -hmm. I mean, it really, it's pretty far away, I realize, but yes. it'll come up on us quickly. Right. Um, there are some estimates, and it's awfully hard to know how good the estimates are because there's so many factors. What's the stock market going to do with these pension asset in terms of returns? What are interest rates going to do because that affects pension liabilities? How many bankruptcies will there be? But if you take a look at some just normal scenarios for those different factors, one study that just came out suggests that the agency would run out of money in the year 2019, 2020, somewhere in that range. And the hit to taxpayers could be as high as just over $100 billion, which compares to the SNL crisis, which in today's dollars was about $200 billion in today's dollars. 
So this could be, you know, similar in magnitude, in order of magnitude to the savings and loan crisis, which we all remember and I think dread seeing another one of. And this is on top of Social Security. Right. That's what this one study um, indicated. And I haven't really looked behind the, the numbers to really say whether um, uh, I have a strong opinion about the study, but that's certainly one study that's, that's been currently put out there to look at this issue. So I think it's a good start to the, to the debate. Is there much of a debate? I mean, that's part of my concern. This seems like a huge looming issue, mm -hmm. and there's very little attention being paid, as far as I can tell. From time to time, it does get raised up both in the media and in, on Capitol Hill. And it usually comes at times when there are major bankruptcies, when Bethlehem Steel went bankrupt, when LTV Steel went bankrupt, when uh, the recent activities in the airline industry tends to raise the profile. But the tricky part of this whole issue is that because PBGC has money today, people aren't going to uh, not get their pension check next year. And that makes this sort of further out approach to the issue a difficult one sometimes for the policymakers to uh, gravitate toward when there are media problems before them. So it's the same kind of dilemma you have in Social Security. We know it's an issue, it's over the horizon, but it's clearly there. Are we going to deal with it now before it gets to be too big a problem? Or do we deal with other issues that are um, immediately in need of attention um, and kick this one down the road a bit? Are there advantages to dealing with it now? Clearly. Because some of those problems in those uh, models about uh, behavior could be changed by new laws that say you must better fund your pension plan or you m must pay higher premiums if you present a lot of risk to the system or you must be more careful about how you invest your monies in your pension plans. There are things that could be done, clearly, that um, if addressed today would reduce the size of the problem down the road. You said earlier that um, no one will really lose money today, but as I understand what you said prior to that, uh, if I'm a pilot with United, <clears throat> don't I stand the chance that I'm not going to get $100,000 mm -hmm. next year right. if they are successful right. in reneging on those commitments? Right. Uh, what I was saying was that PBGC has sufficient money to make all the guaranteed payments under law for some number of years before it runs out of money. The critical issue being under law. <laughs> under law, they're not right. required to pay the full amount that United had promised those pilots, correct? That's right. That's so right. Because some they, people next mm -hmm. year, if United is successful, could face an immediate problem. As did pilots from U.S. Airways when their pension plan was terminated back in the spring or, or late winter of 2003. The guarantee limits were lower than the amount promised. And you see people reacting to that. You see the Delta airline pilots who have in some cases take early retirement because they're allowed to retire at age 50 and take half of their pension promise in a lump sum and walk out the door. And you've seen a, a Delta number of pilots do just that. Well, I think if I'm sitting there <clears throat> making this calculation, if I take it now, at least I can guarantee that half of it will be real versus taking the, my chances that I might not get it if I stay longer with the airline, I think that's a reasonable calculation, yeah. isn't it? It's a complicated analysis because in most cases, or a number of cases, those pilots will get at least half from the PBGC, but in some cases they might not. So it's kind of an individual case-by-case -case analysis you'd have to go through to say, was that a wise decision mm -hmm. to walk out the door and leave a high-paid job behind? That's another part of it. But it does sound as if corporate bankruptcy is one way for a company to shed obligations, therefore make itself more competitive with companies that don't have, that haven't made similar promises. Is the bankruptcy uh, law being perverted here? Is this, is this really becoming a new <coughs> tool of corporate strategy? Mm -hmm. I think um, uh, the bankruptcy law addresses this issue not unlike a lot of other issues in bankruptcy. So essentially what we've said in this country is we're not going to make countries, co companies essentially burn themselves to the ground when they go out of business. We allow those companies to restructure themselves either themselves come out of bankruptcy still as the same company with new financing or to sell their assets off in liquidation and someone else picks up those assets, some of the people, and go back into productive use of those assets. So, in fact, this is really the last obligation that gets washed out. Uh, for example, uh, U.S. Airways was able to renegotiate with their manufacturers of jet aircraft and jet aircraft engines and, and so on and so forth. Uh, early on in the bankruptcy. The last step tends to be these pension plans and they have to prove essentially they'll have to liquidate. The whole company just goes away. There's no more U.S. Airways unless you let us shed one or more of these pension plans. So you may as a worker be faced with 
should I let the should I negotiate with a company, agree to take less in retirement benefits in exchange <coughs> for keeping helping keep the company alive a little bit longer? That's, that's yes, a either, tough calculation. Either, either you do that negotiation um, up front or in bankruptcy, or if the negotiation breaks down, companies tend to go into court and say, we have no choice, we're running out of cash, literally. Um, and we're at a point where we have to either liquidate or shed some of these last liabilities that we cannot renegotiate at arm's length with, with our unions. Not a pretty picture. Thank you so much for coming and explaining all this to us. We've been fortunate to have former executive director of the Pension Benefits Guarantee Corporation, Steve Kandarian, as our guest today. We'll be right back. Some people think of New York as the world's second home. The City University of New York, with students coming from 90 countries and speaking more than 155 languages, is the world's first university. Find us on the web at cuny.edu or call us at 1-800-CUNY-YES. The government's insurance fund for workers' pensions is in very bad shape. That much we can all agree on. The disagreement comes in what to do about the problem. If you're a healthy company able to keep your commitments to your workers, you probably hope the problem will go unnoticed as long as possible. That way, the price tag for this neglect will be so high that the government will simply have to step in and bail the federal agency out. Why, these companies ask, should we be penalized for the poor decision-making of other, less disciplined corporate citizens? If you're a taxpayer, you may feel differently. Unless the private sector is made to pay more now, the burden will fall entirely on the federal government, and that means you and me. Our taxes will have to go up to cover these new obligations, and the longer we wait, the bigger the price we'll all have to pay. There's a reason it's being compared to the $200 billion bailout of the savings and loan crisis of yesteryear. These are critical public policy issues, yet there's little or no serious discussion of them. That is perhaps the saddest part of this whole story. For USA Inc., I'm Sarah Bartlett.